I was in New York doing plays and I had done a TV movie called Kent State. One thing led to another. I got an audition for Tender Mercies and that worked out well. It was such a beautiful experience. I couldn't imagine anything better, really. And then I got a call that this man named Rusty Lemerand had seen me in that movie and wanted to talk to me about something called Electric Dreams. We had a meeting for the first time at the Russian Tea Room, and it was he and Kelly McGillis and me. I just remember us getting acquainted, and I spoke about my lack of affinity for anything technological, and uh, he said, that's good, that's good, you know, we can use that, you know. I, I realized at that time that we both went, ding, you know, this is good, you know. We'll be in the same vein as the character. Oh, damn, I'm late. Well, hurry then. And the next thing I knew, there was this young actress from Chicago who was going to play Madeline. I saw her picture and she was just so lovely. Oh, I was so brand new. I mean, I, I did uh, Dune. And that was when I first moved to L.A. But this was the big leagues. I mean, this was my first leading role in a movie. So you can imagine the stakes were so high, you know. It was really a great surprise when I got the job. You know, when you're that young, you're very brave and you kind of don't even know you're brave. You know, I would just, I felt immediately at home because this was my dream. This was where I was supposed to be. This is, you know, what I'd been dreaming of since I was, before I can remember. So, of course, going to the audition, I was extremely well prepared. And then all of a sudden, it was me and Lenny, and we were just both brand new. Well, I see you again. I think so. We're neighbors. Steve Barron flew over from London, and we met. And at that time, you know, MTV was in its infancy, and it was burgeoning. It was big, you know, and he had just done Billie Jean, and he was the hot director du jour. Steve was making these really incredible little movies. And now, and so they gave him an actual movie. So he was, to me, he was like a famous director because everything was MTV and MTV was actually music then. He was very good technically. And of course they surrounded Steve with the best in the business and you know, on the entire crew. So it was very exciting for me to be around them because I'd never, been on a set for this long and so you know watching them set up cameras and lights and none of that was a distraction for an actress like me that was fascinating to watch how things were done it was the ultimate behind the scenes I can't tell you how much I loved it I took to it with alarming ease and we had the best well it was easy to do because we had the top of the line crews you know I mean I know it's fashionable now to say that we had such a great crew but we we had the A-team, you know, and I didn't know they were the A-team then as much as I do now. I mean, we had Alex Thompson and Peter McDonald and Roy Sharman, just stunning array of people who were all so kind and patient, teaching me this, this greenhorn, you know, how to carry a movie, and I'll be grateful to them forever. Oh, not so fast, you just got here. Pardon me. And Steve was very good with actors. You know, I think I have a picture of him somewhere where, you know, he's like standing there with me and Lenny as we're having this really emotional scene at the end of the movie in the street. And he was like really just there with us. And <laughs> so we kind of, we had the perfect director. Rusty, he was also pretty new like we all were. And so Rusty was around really every day. You know, he was never sort of shunned from the set. It was a rare time when a writer actually got to stay the writer, you know, all the way through production and editing. And so this meant the world to him. And this was such, it was as much a part of him as it became for us. And so he got to see his dream come true and got to see this wonderful creation come to life. And what, what a mind to invent this story so ahead of its time. Alcatraz, what are we doing going to a prison? We shot a lot of location stuff in San Francisco. And then after this glorious month there, I think we shot for two weeks or three weeks, 
because you had a lot more time to shoot a movie back then. And we went from San Francisco and we flew first class to London and the rest of the time we shot at a little studio in Twickenham in London and we both had flats and it was just everything was so glamorous and they just treated us so well. You never felt back then that there was any problem with money or you know we weren't staying in an awful hotel somewhere and and they just treated us like gold. I was quite spoiled after I came off this movie and I sort of let it be known on the next film that I was not happy. Because <laughs> they just, they, they really spoiled us. And I was in Mayfair and I think Lenny was in Chelsea. So he was like in the cool area and I was in the posh area. And I loved it, you know, it was, I wish that they had put us together like with him downstairs and me upstairs, but we might have gotten up to no good if that had happened. <laughs> if I had anything to say about it. <laughs> it was like a, like a summer love. It was really an affair of the heart. You know, those blue eyes and he was so romantic and, and Lenny was always and is an artist first. So we, it was as if we really did fall in love and of course, we, we never acted on that because you didn't, you weren't supposed to do that when you were making a movie. But our connection and our chemistry in that film was so strong that he's still one of my great friends all these years later. And I feel like it's, I don't want to start crying, but I feel like it's, I love him. It's a privilege to have him in my life. And I'm so, it's like we've, so much has happened to both of us. But because we had a connection at such a young age that was so strong, you can never take that away. It was a crash course for both Virginia and I, I think, because MGM treated us like these stars, you know, and we were babies. But it was like Outward Bound because you're sort of thrust into this experience of working every day and doing this movie. And so it bonds you in the same way that Outward Bound does, I think. And that's why we've always been close. We don't see each other for long periods of time, but that was a unique time. It really was extraordinary because I believe that you can't act chemistry. You can try, but it's not, somehow the truth of that is on film. And so that connection, even though it was just the sweet, fun love story, the fact that we had this incredible attraction to each other and this incredible, incredible chemistry, that I think cemented the, the story in the film. Goodbye. Bye. Next. Did you kiss to her? <laughs> yes. Next. Love. And then Bud Court, who was Edgar, the voice of our computer, first of all, Bud insisted that the computer had a name. And everyone was kind of like, oh. And I was like, no, he has to have a name. He's a, he's a being, you know, he's intelligence now. He's artificial intelligence. So Bud had them build this box, this wooden box. And he would sit in the wooden box and they had, he had a microphone and there was a little speaker in the computer. So the scenes between he and Lenny, they actually were talking to each other. And I really, and I'm pretty sure that that was Bud's idea. And so, but if I would happen to accidentally run into Bud, he was like, no, no, you can't see me. And I was like, come here, come here. And he was like, no, no, you can't, I have to be in the box. And, you know, he was completely immersed in that role. The interesting thing was, I never met Bud Court. That was by design which I foolhardily took to, being the method actor I was at that time, I thought, that we should not meet, that, you know, Miles' experience of this inanimate object should be my only reference point, that I shouldn't know Bud, you know, and I knew Bud's work, of course, Harold and Maud. So uh, that was a challenge, and I think one day, during that long shoot, into the hallway, the door opened, and it was, kind of snowing outside and there was this kind of Eskimo hooded person waving at me and saying, hi Lenny. And I said, hi. And I, 
you know, and, and they got closer and closer and the hood comes down and it's Bud. And I said, we're not supposed to meet. And we're ready for you on set. And I said, uh, uh, and I hugged him and then I went on, you know. Relax, it's a local hall. Richard Branson came once and invited Virginia and I to this party on, on some barge that he'd converted. I chose to not go because I had an early call and God, that was a mistake. But uh, I, I did what I did for, the, for love, <laughs> you know. I finally met Sir Richard Branson several years ago when uh, Virgin Air was doing their first flights direct from Los Angeles to Chicago. And he invited me to be on that flight, I suppose, because it was the first flight and I was in the first movie. And, uh, and I had a broken leg. Imagine me going down the stairway. And I was remembering when he picked up, you know, Pamela Anderson and here I was like hobbling down <laughs> the crutches. And I said, you know, would you do it again? Would you make some more movies? Because he was and is a visionary. So I would hope that he would, he would do it again with me. <laughs> Hello. What, what is it? Hi. Oh, yeah. How are you? I'm nervous. I didn't have any musical experience except that I played the piano when I was a child. And the piano is not an instrument that travels well. So as soon as I went to Los Angeles, my days of, much to my mother's dismay, my days of playing the piano were over. And so I think I was able to take to playing the cello quite easily in the beginning. But I really, I wanted to know how to play the cello. Harry Rabinovitz was my teacher and he would teach me every single day, even on weekends. If I came home late at night, I would practice, 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 because unlike other instruments, you can't fake playing the cello because first of all, it's right here, you know, it's, it's right in front of you. So you can't have hand doubles. And I didn't want them to do that. Um, I didn't want them to suddenly go in with someone who really knew what they were doing. And so I, by the time we got to the scenes where I was actually playing and doing the duel with Edgar, I really knew how to play. And it's, of course, they couldn't record my sound because I, w I wasn't good enough for that, but, but I could really do it and I could play along with the playback. Hello? And yes, I met Giorgio Moroder and I took him to task, which was not a good thing to do. Brave or stupid, I don't know which, but I was telling him that this music because now I knew everything about playing the cello. And this music was impossible to play. It's not, I can tell you, it's not written for the cello. And he was kind of like, are you kidding me? I was like, really, it's just not, it's just not possible. <laughs> I can't believe to this day that I did that. You know, so full of myself because I knew what I was talking about. <laughs> I hope he doesn't remember that. Really, come on, you're gonna squash my clarinet. Watch your eye, my clarinet! And so when the scene comes to pass where my cello is broken, this is where I learned a very important lesson as an actor. I spent hours and hours cradling this prop, just crying and crying and crying like the death of my child. And my mother was there and she's cradling me and I'm getting a migraine and crying and crying. And I walk out and I do the scene. And when I saw the film, the only thing there is just me going <laughs> and walking away. Like three seconds of film is me crying. And I spent like 12 hours sobbing, not necessary, self-indulgent. <laughs> Wait till they roll the camera. <laughs> Alan. I remember walking down Broadway in New York with a friend of mine and she said, oh, look, there's a poster on the on the bus stop and well enough time has gone by now I can say this I didn't particularly care for the uh, publicity they used in this country and in in Europe it was much better because you could see two people as opposed to this inanimate object the computer yeah I kind of poo-pooed that when I saw it the first time I saw the film of course was a year later at the premiere, we had a red carpet and we had scores of paparazzi and 
and I sat behind Sheena Easton, which was probably so super cool at the time. It, it was this packed theater, it was the Pantages in Hollywood. And, you know, they made a big fuss over us, and the premiere was a huge success. And I was terribly obnoxious in the audience because anything that was funny, I was the loudest laughter. Oh, it was terrible, but I was so proud and so excited. And we had a big party afterwards. And it was a great success. It was, we had, across the board, incredible reviews. We had Ebert and Siskel gave us two thumbs up, which was such a big deal then. All my friends were going to see this movie. And then the movie was taken out of theaters in two weeks. And back then, that was a death sentence for your film because that's the only place that films could live then. And so it was not considered a success because of that. Do you want some popcorn? It wasn't necessarily a bad thing for me. It didn't put me up onto like the top of the casting lists. But for someone so young, it was probably better that it went away because I had this sort of burst of fame. You know, every magazine, every newspaper, and then it went worldwide, and, and then it all went away. So I got to take a breath, I got to go on to another job. It's not about that movie, it's about the work. Just keep your eyes on the prize. That's all that it's about, just be professional. So that was a, that was a very good lesson for me. I'm fortunate that it happened that way. I really believe so, because I never got ripped apart. I was with a, a certain co-star of mine when I was in Chicago doing a movie, and we went to see it. I, a, I'd rather not talk about that night, because she was uh, a, a Scorpio and uh, took it upon herself to, uh, uh, well, she wasn't very supportive, you know. Memory size, unlimited. Everything. I had heard from someone that I respected very much who had seen it. He reported back to my manager who told me that, that I was charming and I had much to be proud of. And so I always let that be the reigning thing in my, the spin doctor in my head. I would think about this great New York actor I admired and try not to torture myself over anything else, you know. I've grown to love it, you know, and because people have such affection for it. After that, Electric Dreams had a very, very long life on video. And it was like suddenly the number one movie in every video store, and those exploded and were suddenly everywhere. You could actually go rent or buy, and you could watch movies on your time. You didn't have to go to the theater. And then it had a long life on cable. So it was always the gift that kept on giving. There's something about this film that just makes it live on and on. There's something pure and something sweet and something romantic. I just loved everything about it. I can't think of anything that didn't charm me and, and delight me and uh, thrill me. The experience is an electric dream. It really was, and it still is. You know, obviously I glow when I talk about everything about it, and I'm sure there were difficult things that happened that I just erased from my memory because it was my dream come true. Hey, that's a big guitar. That ain't no guitar, it's a cello. You know, I have one last story yes. that I wanted to tell you about. I was making this pilot that never went anywhere. And this was at a time that my career was just tanked. And I was, I, I was a single mom and I had this little baby and I was making this lousy pilot. And I was downtown LA and just trying to get into the spirit of things and carry on. And this extra, this young girl came up to me and she said, I have to tell you that I watched Electric Dreams when I was a little girl. And I now play the cello with the Los Angeles Philharmonic. That's <laughs> just like, because that's what I said when I made that movie. If I can have one little girl learn how to play the cello, and that girl came up and thanked me many years later, 
And it didn't matter that I was doing a crappy job on this show. It didn't matter that my career was so low because that happened.